Okay, hello, welcome anyone who is watching this. My name is Drew Kim. I'm the director of the Center for the Advancement of the Humanities at Marquette University and also an associate professor of theology at Marquette. And a lot of my work has to do with the theology of addiction and recovery and how theology and the humanities can help us think about those, those problems. Um, I'm very honored and privileged to have uh, on, on with us today, the Reverend Molly Dereza, who's gonna to talk to us about her work um, in addiction ministry and recovery ministry. Um, Molly is an ordained minister in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. She served eight congregations in her nearly 30 year ministry and is currently interim pastor of Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Milwaukee. Molly grew up in Omaha, Nebraska and attended Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota, not sure if I pronounced that right, with an undergraduate degree in vocal music. She received her Master's of Divinity degree, magna cum laude, from the Nashatoa House Episcopal Seminary in Nashatoa, Wisconsin, and attended the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago for studies in Lutheran history and theology. After the tragic death of her son five years ago due to a fentanyl overdose, she began to wonder how the church community could help people such as herself and their families as they struggled with addiction. In June of 2019, she co-authored a resolution adopted at the Greater Milwaukee Synod's annual assembly, which created a task force to study how congregations might become meaningful communities of help in this area. The task force formed a partnership with Faith Partners, who has been training congregations and clergy for many years to help congregations develop ministries of effective response to this epidemic. With them, the task force has hosted readiness, leadership, and team trainings for several congregations in the greater Milwaukee area. The task force is known as the Healing Network, and I'll put a, a link to that in the description of the video below. A great descriptor of the network of participating congregations who are making important connections with other community stakeholders, treatment providers, and recovery specialists, and most especially between themselves, as they seek to provide vital and healing support for their members who are affected by this devastating epidemic. Okay, so thank you so much for being with us today, Molly. Um, and giving us the opportunity to, to learn from you, from your experience. I thought maybe we could, we could start, and I read a little bit about it there in your, in your bio, but maybe you could speak a little bit about the addiction ministry that you do and kind of how you, how you came to be involved, involved in addiction ministry and recovery. Well, thank you, Professor Kim. And I'll just uh, provide a little bit of correction. The college is Gustavus Adolphus College. <laughs> and the seminary is the Neshota House, okay. which is right down the street from you. It's an Episcopal seminary. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, so uh, you just mentioned that I lost a son to an opioid overdose uh, over five years ago. And um, I, it was very sudden. He had been in treatment for our in recovery, full-blown recovery for six years or more, and uh, then uh, died of a relapse. And with uh, alcohol, you wake up the next morning after a binge with um, fentanyl, you don't. So it was very sudden. He left two beautiful children and um, a family in abject, um, abject sadness. And um, what, so when I came back from uh, the funeral, I was serving a parish in the Milwaukee area then. Um, I didn't know how to talk to the congregation about it. I didn't know what to say. Um, there was a lot of stigma and shame in my mind. You know, what kind of mother was I? What kind of pastor was I? What kind of, what might they think about my son? Um, and I know the congregation cared. They were deeply compassionate, but they didn't know what to say either. So. They made me a prayer shawl, which was very kind. And we went about our business and didn't really mention it. Um, and that got me to thinking about uh, how alone I felt and, and estranged and why that was. 
if I was a pastor, I thought certainly other people would feel this way if they had similar experiences. And I began to think about how I and other clergy have unwittingly contributed to the stigma of, of this problem by referring out our members. Uh, we find good links for people to um, talk to uh, recovery specialists and get into treatment. And, and we provide counseling one-on-one -on -one with them. But, but that habit creates, um, as I said, a referring out of the congregation. And, and there's no creation of a loving, supportive community that's developed around the needs uh, of a person's healing. And so I wondered what that might look like. Um, so I got together with some colleagues and I got, uh, went to some seminars and, and uh, summits with the people who were in work with uh, opioid addiction in the state and um, authored a resolution along with a colleague which created a task force in our Greater Milwaukee Synod, which is a collection of about 120 congregations of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And uh, authored this resolution that created a task force to look into what we might be doing to help pastors and congregations uh, do this work. And um, so we, along the way, and you know, in our jargon, we would say it was the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we came alongside this organization called Faith Partners which has uh, uh, been in operation for about 20 years or more, uh, which has been helping congregations all over the country to do just exactly what we were trying to do. And um, so we put that together and uh, we had some trainings and we've got some congregations that are forming teams now, authentic teams to do this work. And the beauty of it is that they're coming together. They're not doing it just in isolation um, and trying to reinvent the wheel in their own uh, parochial setting. But they're coming together to share ideas and experiences and, and uh, support one another as they begin to do this. So uh, long story short, um, it's one of those things where we hear in Romans, all things work for good for those who love God and are called according to God's purpose. And um, it's hard when you've lost a son uh, and your heart is broken and there's always a hole in your life to believe that there's any good that can come out of it. But to the extent that my sadness can help others, that's the good. It's really, really beautifully stated there, Molly. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, um, you said earlier that you, you had a, a concern that you realized that that maybe the church or church community sometimes perhaps unintentionally further the, the stigma and shame that goes along with addiction rather than kind of providing a an alternative to those and i know that you've um, you've read uh timothy mcmahon king's book addiction nation and, and you actually recommended it to me and i sometimes use it in my core 4929 courses here um, at, at Marquette. And so I wonder if maybe you could talk a little bit about, well, what, what are, I mean, what the approach of the church should be to people who ex are experiencing addiction and way, ways maybe the church sometimes falls short of that. And... Well, I'm glad you mentioned uh, King's book because um, that book uh, addresses this issue of stigma. And uh, he states quite boldly, I think, and correctly that the story of addiction is about all of us. That um, the overdose crisis is just one of many manifestations of uh, an addic the addictive nature of, of our society and our people. And uh, to the extent that the church has always, or generally speaking, seen addiction as a moral issue instead of a sociological and communal issue. It estranges its, its um, members from one another and, and doesn't provide a pathway of support for them. 
Um, I think that that is manifest or seen in, in the AA groups that are in the church basements of the building. Um, you know, those are the folks down there in the basement and we don't know what they're doing and should we even give them a key to get into the building? You know, that that's the kind of uh, experience that I've had in congregations when, um, since my son died, I realized that really that's where ministry is most fully going on, that literally people are saving each other's lives. And, and the other thing I've learned too is that people who are in active recovery can be our teachers. Uh, King says that we're all addicted to something, <laughs> you know, uh, not necessarily drugs or alcohol, but it might be, uh, well, you can think of things, I'm sure, that people in our society are are wedded to, um, and it's especially increased because of our isolation from one another. Um, we turn to things that are not helpful for us. And spiritually, we are turning away from the one who can help us. Uh, we don't like this notion of helplessness, do we? Um, the message in our culture is it's every person for themselves and, and pull yourself up by the bootstraps and, and um, rugged individualism, which doesn't allow us to, to call on others because we are stuck or need help. Yeah, that's, I, I actually spoke with, with Drew Brooks earlier. And so his, his video, that interview is gonna be up on this channel also. And, um, and we were mentioning some of the same problems and that idea came up of the, the problem of kind of individualism and viewing um, addiction as a, as a moral failing. And one thing that I, I asked Drew his thoughts about, and I guess I'll ask you also, um, is precisely that claim that you just mentioned that um, the idea that everyone is addicted to something that Timothy McMahon King discusses. And I'd be very interested to hear your view on that. I mean, because when I was talking with Drew Brooks, he was like he was giving he was attributing that claim to Gerald May, who of course is you know where Timothy McMahon King is getting it. And it seems like one of the things that the claim does is it it helps situate addiction as something that's more of a, a we problem than a them and us type of thing, um, which is one of King's major points. It also speaks to a reality because May you know, views addiction as just unhealthy attachments. And as you say, you know, if you're going to talk about unhealthy attachments, who doesn't have an unhealthy attachment, whether it's to, you know, it could be drugs or alcohol, or it could be validation or work or, you know, even, you know, running. Or I was telling Drew that I was wondering if Tom Brady is addicted to football because he seems to not be able to stay away, you know, <laughs> he's kind of coming, you can't quit, you know. Um, but I wonder, um, a couple of things with that. I mean, so I wonder if do you think it's a problem, this idea, because in order to get there, you have to stretch the, the definition of addiction, kind of stretch the meaning of it and expand the definition. And when you have some kinds of addictions, I always talk about this with my class, but addictions, you know, as you painfully know, that they carry mortality rates with them, like fentanyl and even alcohol. Um, is it is do you think that viewing everybody as addicted in some way is helpful at breaking down that stigma or does it draw attention away from the addictions that are kind of most in need of sustained societal attention well uh, that's a good uh, deep question and one of the things that comes to my mind is that we tend to slap labels on people and call them addicted you know, and you're either addicted or you're not, um, which isn't necessarily helpful. Um, in his preface, King says that the addictive process is at work in all of our lives. It functions in our society and institutions, our politics and churches. Um, it's present everywhere when everyone says, I do the thing I don't want to do and I don't do the thing I should do. Um, and he also, uh, manages to call this idea of the process a spectrum. You know, that, that it's, a, it's a process. You're, 
that that you live into. And the other thing I want to say about that is that we often think that addiction is just about getting rid of something, mm -hmm. right? If I just stop drinking, stop eating, stop, you know, gaming or whatever it is, then I'll be fine, you know, but that doesn't address the issue that there was a hole there in the first place that you had to fill with something. Uh, St. Augustine talks about his heart, heart being restless until it rests in, in God. And of course, there's been all sorts of other takes on that saying, you know, I have a hole, a God-shaped hole in my heart and all that kind of stuff. And so to that point, I think that, that addictive uh, or addiction ministries can see um, the opportunity, not just to help people as they struggle, but to help everyone with their spiritual development. Mm -hmm. What is that whole about in our lives? And I think we're all feeling that right now with the stress of pandemic and, and the war that's going on and the divisive politics is, you know, where is God in all of this? Does God care? Um, if God cares, is God just judging? Um, are we bad? Or maybe the worst of all things is maybe there is no God. And I think that those are really legitimate questions that everybody asks. And the faith community can be a place where people can ask those questions. I always like to tell people who are struggling that faith is less about having all the answers than living with the questions. And that is a, a, a safe place for people to be honest about themselves and their lives their hopes and their dreams and their failures. Um, and that is missing in our society um, in a meaningful way. You know, we kind of stumble on it in our PTA meetings and our sports activities and uh, whatever it is. But, but do we have a chance to come together and ask these existential questions, you know, mm -hmm. um, that, that drive us to, to share um, the hole in our heart. Right, or to express honestly our doubts and fears and concerns and struggles. I, I mentioned in my talk with Drew the, the quote from uh, Kent Dunnington where he says that church should be more like a 12-step meeting than a suburban book club, you know, because I think you're, you're, you're spot on and that in our society, and I don't know, maybe it's always been this way to some degree, but there, there seems to be an increasing need to always be kind of curating oneself and presenting um, oneself. And, and you know, I talk with the students about this with Instagram and the kind of social media where there's almost a pressure to be presenting, you know, your, your life is going splendidly amidst all the things you mentioned, you know, and kind of everybody knows it's, it's not exactly, um, accurate but it's still difficult to find the kinds of spaces you mentioned where a person can talk can be transparent you know about kind of where they are with things and that gets to another point from king that i thought maybe you could you could help us think through i, I want to circle back to kind of some of the stuff about shame maybe later in the conversation but when you know you meant you mentioned the the, the god god-shaped hole and it seems to me that very often people don't think of the reason, when you think about what is a person seeking in addiction and what is it that gets them to that place um, of major addiction, I think a lot of times people have assumptions that it's like, well, they're just kind of seeking pleasure or they're just kind of bad people or whereas King argues in that book that you know, in addiction, people are really seeking fulfillment of what are basic human needs, you know, needs for belonging and community and a sense of purpose and identity and even, um, you know, a sense of the transcendent it's escape, relief. So I wonder if just kind of you have any, any thoughts about that when we think about the role of spirituality and help us, helping us understand addiction and, and recovery also. Well, first of all, uh, when you talk about um, human need and uh, the possibility of realizing 
our fullness as human beings. I think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and you can't get to that point unless you're safe, can you? You know, um, that's the most basic uh, of human needs. And, and so the first thing about uh, this, the spiritual community is to create a climate of safety um, where people can be open. Um, I know as a pastor, when it, it's kind of miraculous when I see people struggling to talk about what it is going on in their lives, and, and all of a sudden they hear somebody else talk about it, and there's this incredible sense of relief on their face. It's like, I can talk about this. I can share this. Um, and I, I think that that is what, what stops the church from being effective, is that there is this judgment. We walk into these huge sanctuaries with these big crosses and, and all this uh, majesty and mystery. Um, and I think that's right. I mean, I, I, as a Lutheran, I love all that stuff. And I'm sure, you know, other liturgical churches do too, but there needs to be a, a, a way to connect people to um, a community which seems to them to be safe. And then they can, they can talk about these things. Um, I think that that kind of authentic community, which is connected by caring, um, is an imperative for the church. I don't think it's a, a luxury. I think that it really is going to determine the church's relevance um, and survival in the years ahead. Uh, if we can make the, help people make that connection and see uh, the church is a place to gather hurting people. Um, and I think that's, frankly, what it means to be faithful to the mission of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I guess, I mean, so part of my follow-up question with that would be about, um, you know, this is, all, I was just talking with a student about this not too long ago, you know, I mean, this is not a profound insight or anything, but, you know, that's, it's a pretty clear message in the in the scriptures about not judging and not condemning and being merciful if you want to be shown mercy and so forth. And yet we still do encounter this kind of moral model that separates, you know, addicts into sort of people that aren't aren't worthy of empathy in the same way as somebody who might be suffering from a different disease. You know, this is one of King's points. So I wonder if you could say a bit about that, um, because it seems to me like if you went into church and said, you know, my loved one just got diagnosed with, I don't know, you know, cancer or something like that, there wouldn't necessarily be, it would be a, I, I heard one speaker call it, call it a casserole disease. So like, oh no, that means we need to show you support and embrace you and, you know, bring, bring, bring you dinner. How can we help? But there's not quite that same or at least in a lot of congregations, that same freedom to come in and say, hey, my, you know, I think my father is struggling with alcoholism or whatever it may be. So do you think that moving addiction into more of a, a disease paradigm and away from the kind of moral failing paradigm is a important kind of part of how the church needs to change its thinking? Well, what, what you're getting at, I think, Professor Kim, is that, that addiction is a multifaceted disease. Mm. It has implications for our moral, our spiritual and behavioral health. And, and so um, someone who's in the process of addiction, uh, going deeper and deeper and deeper, commits moral failures, you know, and hurts people, hurts families. Um, there's a higher rate of suicide for kids whose parents um, are using um, depression, all sorts of things. And so the church has a responsibility to call out, call out these things. Um, so, but it, it requires more of an understanding of it as a disease um, before we can tackle that codependency that we all share with, uh, with the um, addict. Um, I have been working um, in the last couple of years with the Wisconsin Office of Children's Mental Health and um, their community impact partners division, which is um, professionals who come together and discuss how they can help children's uh, children in our state. 
And it's always interesting to me, I am the only clergy representative in that group. And um, these are people who are highly committed to helping people uh, work through the, the disease of addiction and other mental health challenges. But I, I feel like I'm a placeholder. I need to say, wait, wait a minute, we can include the church in this, um, in our efforts. The church can be an effective place uh, to implement some of these things that we need. Um, and it's, it's a place where from birth to the grave, we have people sharing support and experience. But unless we can get that word out, and I, I think the problem is that we stay inside our walls. Mm. You know, we think that the church is in the sanctuary, um, but that wasn't Jesus, was it? I mean, he, he taught in the temples, but he went out in the world. And, and so to train people to be church or a faith community in the context of their lives is an important thing. Um, if you're talking to a friend who is, open and sharing with you something that that she's suffering with um you're being church you know you're bringing that um compassion and support in that context you know somewhere along the line you may want to mention jesus <laughs> you know or your greater power or whatever it is but um I, I think that is a, a, a real important thing. And, and oftentimes churches jump the gun. They say, well, we got to get them in church and we got them to believe what we believe. And then, you know, we can help them. Yeah. Uh, it's like, you know, cleaning the fish before you catch it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible analogy. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you really can't do that. <laughs> but anyway, I, um, I think that, you know, we as spiritual leaders and the spiritual community can address something that's really important today. As I mentioned, the Office of Children's Mental Health is moving into a major initiative as we speak on social connectedness. Mm -hmm. During pandemic, they've identified through their data how important this has been and how absence, absent it's been during the pandemic. And so they want communities, schools, and, and other places to be mindful of this thing, to implement strategies uh, so that people can uh, go through life um, with a, a supportive, loving community around them. And I think, you know, that's what church should be. Mm. And I uh, unfortunately don't think we are intentional or mindful always of doing that or know how to do that. You touched on so many important things there. And I think that when you say connectedness, if I remember correctly, I think King defines spirituality basically as connectedness or something like that is how he understands the word. But I, I wanted to kind of go back to something earlier that you mentioned because you mentioned responsibility. And I think that that's an important question that comes up. And I've been trying to wrestle for a long time with the idea of how the, the, the need to um, accept responsibility and encourage others to accept responsibility. You know, you see it in the 12 step, 12 steps literature, searching moral inventory and so forth. How you kind of, you know, connect that to the, the simultaneous need to, to work against that sort of disintegrating sense of shame and low self-efficacy that a person can have when they're experiencing major addiction. And they're aware of the fact, like you say, that they're causing harm to those around them or to their loved ones. Um, how do you kind of hold together the, the need to sort of not create shame and stigma, but at the same time, encourage the adoption of responsibility for the effects of um, you know, what's happening? Well, if I may, I'm going to quote Martin Luther, uh, which is appropriate for uh, who I am. Um, on his uh, writing on the freedom of a Christian, he says that um, a Christian is perfectly free when it comes to God's grace, that uh, nothing we can do can earn God's love, that it's already there that in a sense, that hole in the heart is something that God fills. 
not because we feel it, but because God does. But then Luther goes on to say, but we are dutiful servants, uh, responsible for everyone. So the freedom that we have and the grace that we receive ourselves, um, we are bound to love our neighbors in that way. That is really the essence of the 12-step program, you know, is coming to that point where we're helpless and, and then we believe that that someone greater than ourselves, some power or something, God can restore us to sanity and, and, uh, and then go through the steps that restore ourselves uh, to ourselves and to the community. Um, this is what's so wonderful about um, Richard Rohr's Breathing Underwater uh, tool, which is a, a study that congregations can do, um, which is using um, uh, the 12 step program to um, apply it to spiritual development in the congregation. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've familiar with, with some of Roar's work and, and I'm glad you mentioned the, and it's really interesting how you mentioned the, the role of, of grace and Martin Luther is certainly more than welcome to, to make appearances. Um, I, I suppose the, the question though is, um, you know, if, well, I'll, I'll put it this way. One way that I've heard the differing understandings of grace, roughly speaking in the thought of say Aquinas and Luther is that for Aquinas, grace is, is more and more and more and more, you know? So it's God gives you grace and then you participate in that grace and you get, um, you know, you, you improve morally, it's part of sanctification, and then the more you improve, the more you become, the more your capacity to, for moral perfection continues to increase, and you get, you know, the virtues, and the gifts, and the fruits of the Spirit, and it just kind of keeps growing all the way until, you know, this status comprehensoris, and the, the beatific vision, it's part of this process of sort of you know, purging oneself from sin so that sin doesn't, you don't have to go to purgatory and have it purged there and so forth. So more and more. And for Luther, I've heard it explained as again and again, um, which is more like we kind of, we receive grace, we respond to it, we sin, and God kind of continually accompany, accompanies us through our repeated stumbles and moral failings and, um, and continually sort of returns to give us grace um, after we inevitably falter, um, largely by ceasing to rely on God and starting to rely again on our own efforts. So whether it's more and more or again and again, I guess my question is that if there's a person who feels enormously sort of distant from God, and there's a sense of shame that, um, that the message of responsibility heightens in that person, you know, because maybe they're not necessarily refusing response. I mean, you can envision somebody in a resentful state kind of refusing to accept responsibility, but you can also envision somebody with major addiction. I was just watching a documentary on this the other day who seem that they're very well aware of the harm that their action is causing, but they feel as though they're acting under compulsion, you know, and maybe it started with moral failing, but now at this point, it's just, they don't feel like they have any agency. And I guess the question is whatever kind of theology of grace you have, how is it, or is it maybe an impossible question? Like, how do you, how do you communicate to a person who maybe feels that great distance and the idea of recovery seems like an impossible dream, almost cruel. How do you communicate that grace um, to a well, person who's Well, one thing I would have to say is that, you know, we as theologians debate these, mm -hmm. but I think both um, Aquinas and Luther have points and, and, and it may be a both and situation. Uh, but as we uh, are, conversing in our theological domains, people are living this out and they're experiencing what it is. And so we can listen to them, you know, as they are in recovery, what it means for them. And, and as a, 
either a moral failing, but then reminding ourselves that this is also a biochemical disease, that we're learning more and more and more how it affects the centers of our brain that, that remove our ability to uh, make good choices and, mm. and want a drug or whatever the addiction is above all else, even though the all else is important. Um, mm. And so I think there's all sorts of ways that we can communicate grace to people uh, through the medical community, through um, medical medication assisted uh, recovery, through, um, you know, uh, psychotherapy and, um, you know, treating the whole person. Um, and then also being for them, uh, what it means to, to have the impact of community on the human brain. What does that look like? I, I haven't seen any studies, but I know you and I have talked about that, that, you know, that there has to be an effect on our brains when we feel supported and loved in a community. Yeah. And so that in itself is offering grace, isn't it? That, that we're saying, you don't have to do this alone. There's all sorts of resources with the medical community. There's um, psychotherapy, but there is also there are also people who can support us in this. And I think that we, importantly, grace is lived out, not just in a person's life, but in the community, you know, and that is the most important thing, I think, in today's age, when we feel that we have to do everything on our own, you know, that, that our destiny is ours to make, and uh, eventually people have this idea that they're gonna stand before someone, you know, uh, and they don't know what that is or who that is, uh, but they're gonna have to account for something. And, and I, was I a good person in this life? And will that someone let me into heaven? And, and that just escapes the whole idea that, that faith can be something of abundance in our lives before we die. It's so, it's, I find it so profound um, what you're saying. And I was thinking, I mean, I think it kind of circles back to one of the first things you said about community, you know, when you were talking about the neurological effects and so forth. I know I was reading something the other day that the number one need of the central nervous system is safety, you know, feeling of safety. And that kind of ties into everything, hey, because, you know, if you can't, you can't express what you're truly feeling or who you truly are, then that means you probably don't feel safe, <laughs> you know? And so um, if the churches aren't, aren't providing that, then I agree very much with your earlier statement about maybe falling short of the, the mission of Jesus there. Um, well, we're getting a little bit short on time, so I wanted to kind of move um, to the last couple of questions here. And one I wanted to ask you about is, you know, King talks a bit of, in his book, The Addiction Nation, about sort of thinking about the resurrection in connection to addiction. And I've heard you discuss that also. And so I was wondering if maybe you could say something about the, the theological significance or meaning of the resurrection as applied to addiction and recovery. Well, as uh... Christians, both Catholic and Lutheran, we say in uh, the Apostles' Creed, we believe in the communion of saints and the resurrection. Um, and I think we don't always put those together, that resurrection is not only at the end of our lives, although we trust in that, but it also is a daily thing that's enjoined not only solely, but experienced communally. Um, that, that is that, that your, your needs are my needs and vice versa. And your joys are my joys. Um, and so as, as people recover, we can experience resurrection in their lives. Um, when and and it it changes us it may even change our brain centers <laughs> you know as someone else is being safe we become safer in our feelings you know um it certainly works that way with food you know when when everybody's fed everybody's happy so 
Um, I, I think that, that that idea of resurrection needs to be opened up because indeed the church has seen resurrection as the uh, reward, the certificate you get when you've lived a moral life, right? <laughs> Big R, here you go. <laughs> Got your credentials. <laughs> And I think that, you know, uh, obviously Jesus didn't hang out with credentialed people. He hung out with suffering people who, um, who were being resurrected, right? Mm. I, I, I wanna leave you with a thought. Um, after my son died, I had uh, an opportunity to preach on the passage in Luke of the widow of Nain and, um, you know, Jesus comes into the, this area around Nain and, and there's a funeral processional and um, comes to find out that the only son of a widow has died and which makes her totally estranged from the community. Um, and she has no more possessions or status because when her husband died, that was given to her son who cared for her. But now that her only son has died, she is essentially homeless and um, so uh, I got stuck with that passage because what happens is Jesus rides in on his white horse and resurrects the son and all is good and well. And um, you hear that in common conversations now, it's God saved me or God saved my house from the tornado when your neighbor's houses were flattened. So I wondered, um, what about the other widows in Nain? What about the ones who didn't have Jesus resurrect their sons and that were living in, in uh, you know, begging and uh, in that day feeling shame because uh, that was a sign of God's disfavor. And I, I got stuck with that because I thought I related to it myself. Why, after my prayers, did this have to happen to me? Why my son? And where was Jesus? But then I began to think and imagine that the other widows of Nain might have been starting the first church. That the other widows of Nain um, who were still suffering might have been coming together in, in that estrangement and helping each other you know, helping each other to find resources and food and helping each other belong. And, and they might have heard Jesus's words and wondered that perhaps there was more to it than this instant miraculous thing that doesn't happen to most people. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that was a pivotal point in my uh, preaching, in my approach toward uh, you know, Jesus's ministry among us, you know, that, that it, it is not um, a, a chance for us to say, ta-da, Jesus was here. Uh, you know, Jesus favors me, but doesn't favor you. But maybe he still leaves us with that question. You know, mm -hmm. how can we call Jesus into our midst when things don't always turn out the way we want them to? Mm -hmm. um, you understand what I mean? I think maybe. I mean, it definitely seems like responding that way is preferable to shaking your fist at God. But then at the same time, I wonder if a little bit of fist shaking is permitted, you know? <laughs> I, had a, I had a friend. I said, I want to shake my fist at God. And he said, no, you should bow your head. And I said, can't I do both? <laughs> My head bowed, and my head <laughs> lifted. I think that's a, a really a important posture for prayer. Oftentimes, mm, yeah, no, I agree with you on that. I think it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier about the, the transparency. Because if church is a place where you have to pretend to be feeling a way that you don't because you're suffering, then you know what are we doing? You know, so. Well, I think I could listen to you talk about about these sorts of things for for ten hours. So, so maybe you'll have to come on again at some point, and and we can we can 
pull out some different questions, but I just want to thank you again for your ministry, for all you do, for taking your, your time, which I know is, is limited even in your sort of quasi retirement here that isn't much of a retirement um, to, to be with us and to share your insights on this really important topic. And I think your ministry um, helps, a, helps a lot of people and just want to thank you for what you do. And I want to thank you too, Professor Kim, because I know we came together uh, a year or two ago when mm -hmm. you were um, presenting uh, the uh, series at Clement Manor, and we began these conversations. And I, I can't help but believe that the kind of conversations that we're having now should be um, more and more between colleagues, that, that we should be considering these questions. Uh, as we've done today, and, and that they're important that we get them out there and talk about them and be um, intentional about gathering together around this. So thank you for allowing me to be uh, conversation in conversation with you. Oh, no, I completely agree. Yeah, we'll do it again sometime. And just, uh, yeah, I think that Clement Manor talk, that was in a different world, hey, because that was before the pandemic, wasn't it, I think? And so, yeah. We got a little memory of what that world was like. I think it might have been. But anyway, thank you again for coming. And um, yeah, we'll see you next time. Take care and God bless. God bless.